welcome to um, this honor and talk. Um, we are welcoming Joan Benoit Samuelson here. Um, and Joan, I have, a, I have a large introduction for Joan, so she's just going to have to sit tight for a few minutes. Um, I'm Janet Lohman. I'm the Senior Vice President and Dean for Student Affairs here. So here we go. Joan Benoit Samuelson is one of the most decorated runners in the world and the most rec recognizable athlete in Bowdoin's history. Joni, as she is known to many, is a native Mainer and a passionate advocate for her home state. She grew up in Cape Elizabeth, the only girl among four children, and her family was active and athletic with a special love for skiing. Her dad was a member of Bowdoin class of 1943, and Joni tells of crawling all over the lions in front of the art museum as a child. She came to Bowdoin with a love for running, but she also played field hockey here, at least until running took over. She spent a year at North Carolina State to focus on training. She was by then an All-American, but she returned to Bowdoin to finish her degree, which she earned as a history and environmental science major. Still a student, she won the Boston Marathon in 1979, a feat that immediately captured the attention of the local national and national media. She told a reporter right after that first win that her back and legs were bothering her and that even though this is my first competitive marathon, it might be my last. <laughs> of course, it was definitely not her last. She won Boston again in 1983, setting a course record in the process that stood for 11 years. In 1984, she made history by winning the gold medal in the inaugural Women's Olympic Marathon in Los Angeles. That same year, she won the Philadelphia Half Marathon. Oh. That same year, she won the Philadelphia Half Marathon, setting an American record, won the Jesse Owens Award, USA Track and Field's highest accolade, and was inducted into the Maine Sports Hall of Fame. The following year, she won the Chicago Marathon, again setting an American record, won the Sullivan Award, given to the top amateur US athlete, and was awarded the Bowdoin Prize, the college's highest honor. And she continues to run. In 2019, she not only won her age group in the Boston Marathon, she finished within 30 minutes of her winning time 40 years earlier. <laughs> That's not all. In 1997, Samuelson founded the TD Bank Beach to Beacon 10K road race and is chair of the board of directors. The race, set in Samuelson's hometown, attracts the world's elite runners and has received awards for its environmentally sustainable operation. She's a longtime board member of the Friends of Casco Bay and co-chair of the Running Industry Diversity Coalition, and she is a member of Bowdoin's Board of Trustees. Joni has been inducted into the National Track and Field Hall of Fame, the National Distance Running Hall of Fame, the International Scholar Athlete Hall of Fame, the International Women's Sports Foundation Hall of Fame, and the Olympic Hall of Fame. She is the author of two books, Running Tide and Joan Samuelson's Running for Women, and she narrates a podcast series called Miles to Go, which tells the story of women's running, and is a featured instructor on the Masterclass streaming platform where she teaches a runner's mindset. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. So I'm just going to set it up. We, we are here till 3.15. Um, and what we have decided to do is I'm going to ask a few questions. And then we're going to open it up to the um, audience for questions. And so if you have some questions, um, think about what that might look like. And we will give you a chance. Um, to ask those questions to Joni. Um, I will also say I have a, a limited edition bobblehead of Joni right next to me. That is really the most important Maybe. accolade of the list. Um, OK, you ready? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first thing I really would love to talk about is Bowdoin and your connection to Bowdoin. And um, obviously, we're celebrating the 50 years of women at Bowdoin. Um, you have a connection, your dad went here, but you were here in the 70s when Bowdoin was really becoming a place for women and, and women as students here, and I'd love to just hear about your experience as a Bowdoin student. 
Well, thank you, Janet, and thank you all for coming this afternoon. And I'm delighted and honored and humbled to stand in the proud company of the other honorettes. Um, I heard <laughs> Kathy speak last night. I heard Janet speak this afternoon. I'm looking forward to Raquel at baccalaureate and then Lori this evening. Um, so um, it's um, humbling, but also very exciting. Um, We've all made our marks in different areas, and I think that says a lot about the diversity of women and their interests and their strengths and uh, how they've empowered other people to go out and achieve their goals and live their dreams and you know reach for their aspirations as well. Um, so I came to Bowdoin um, in 1975. I did survive until 75 in high school. I entered high school as a first year. Back then it was called, a, I was a freshman, but now we're called first year students. And uh, Title IX legislation passed just as I finished my first year in high school. And there weren't a lot of opportunities in high school at that time, but with the passage of the legislation and the new law, all of a sudden the floodgates opened and all sorts of opportunities were open to me, as Janet referenced, I grew up with three brothers, so it was survival of the fittest from an early age. Um, they all had opportunities in sport, um, but I couldn't play. I would hang over the um, chain link fences, hoping that a coach would recognize me and bring me in when the teams were short in the summer months and families were taking vacations, but that never happened. The only sports that were really available to me um, were, were skiing and tennis. And uh, so I pursued those sports early on. And then um, after I graduated from high school, I had broken my leg my sophomore year in high school, and I had dreams of making it to the Olympics and skiing. But as the adage, no guts, no glory goes, I didn't have the guts in the starting gate the following year, and I had started to run as a form of rehab. So I really liked it. It was affordable. It was accessible. I could do it at any time of year. I didn't need a lot of special equipment and I didn't have to wait for the snow, um, so it was all good. And I just kept challenging myself with longer and longer runs, but I still loved the sport of field hockey, um, and I um, looked around at different schools, but had this real affinity for this place called Bowdoin. I remembered my childhood playing kickball in the uh, McAdam, uh, parking lot at St. Albans Church in Cape Elizabeth talking to other girls and where we were going to go to college. And a lot of us were saying, we wish we could go to Bowdoin, but they don't accept women. But um, it, it changed, fortunately. And uh, I remember visiting another college. And it was a rainy, dreary day. And the campus had emptied out for the weekend. And I said, I don't want to go here. I want to go to Bowdoin. And I remember my. Uh, interview in admissions with the then dean of admissions, Dick Maul, and the first question he asked me, and probably a lot of you won't know what this means, but he said, what did you think of the Bobby riggs Billy Jean King tennis match? <laughs> and I said, talk about a loaded question. <laughs> and then he went on to, to ask other questions. But um, anyway, I did wind up here, and um, I was, I think, the first full class to complete the four years here. And I, I had a lot of friends who were um, in the upper classes, and I did play field hockey and had a lot of mentoring there, uh, and uh, knew a woman from my hometown who was in the first class. And uh, it just happened. And then you know I had the best roommates ever who will be joining me this evening, which I'm really excited about, um, because we've had an unbelievable friendship all these years. And uh, they both played field hockey as well. And Janet played field hockey as well. So we have this mutual affinity for, for that sport. But I've talked her into running. So she'll be back soon. Uh, and it was, I never felt, I, was, I always felt welcome as one of the first, or one of the early um, classes on campus. And I, um, they wasn't a track team. Uh, at the time, there was another a classmate of mine, Anne Marie Goldstein, who came up from Virginia, and she ran cross country with the boys and ran track. I joined her during the track season indoors, and I still have the little white piece of paper from MIT that said JV men's mile, first third place. Um, <laughs> so 
it was still a man's world, but we made our way, and we had support of, of the coaches and the administration, and um, it was just another journey that, that worked out for me, and I so appreciate So what were your favorite classes here? Boy, um, I had a lot of favorite classes, but I think Barbara Castor with public speaking and Chuck Huntington with ornithology and, of course, Sam Butcher with environmental studies one. That really, those classes really um, sent me on my way and helped to develop the passion I have. Oh, and then there was history with Lily Whiteside and uh, um, uh, John Walters. So um, the history of the jazz age, that was a great class. I remember the day after I won the Boston Marathon, um, he had all the music blaring when I walked into class. It was pretty exciting. I thought I'd snuck off to Boston, and I came back a Tuesday, Tuesday evening in time for dinner. The Boston Marathon takes place on a Monday. And I walked into what is now Cole's Tower, but was the senior center then. And I thought very few people knew that I had escaped to, to Boston and had blown off classes for two days. And, <laughs> and uh, the whole dining room stood to its feet, and it was, I said, oh, I guess they did know that <laughs> I went to Boston. But. Um, so uh, one of the pieces that um, comes across is your just deep commitment to environmental studies, the climate, and, um, and the ways in which you sort of lead your life through, through a lot of that work. Um, I listened to one of your podcasts recently that you talked about sort of athletes being change makers, and, and you really connected it to the efforts around climate change and really understanding the environment, and I'd be curious to sort of, if you could elaborate on that. Well, I'm out there every day throughout the four seasons, as long as we have changing seasons, I'll call them four seasons. Um, and I just feel as though I'm an environmental barometer for everything from ambient air quality. Actually, my last run before I took off for LA um, in 84 was um, a run that comes from our house in Freeport and circles the track and then goes through Pickard Fields and then goes back down Main Street and up Pleasant Hill past the Bowdoin Gardens and, and home. That's a good 20 miles. I never, I never overestimate my mileage, but um, we'll call it 20. And, uh, um, there was a classmate painting a house uh, at the far side of, of the track, and he said, go get him. And I just will always remember that, and I did go get him. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I didn't think I would win. Um, the great late, great late Greta Weitz was going to win in my mind, but I really wanted a medal. But anyway, um, so the ambient air quality, I took a lot of grief for hanging out in Maine because LA has a fairly polluted environment and it was the middle of the summer and what people don't realize is that the Gulf of Maine, the fastest warming body of water in the world, or at least one of them, um, if not the warmest body of water, um, is a catch basin for everything that comes up the eastern seaboard. So we had really bad ozone levels. And uh, actually, I felt the air in LA was better than the air in Maine that summer. So that, and then uh, just, you know, ocean acidification and, and, and the erosion that's happening with surging tides and rising tides. Um, I see all this day in and day out, and, and it's, it's changing. I mean, what I wear in the winter usually isn't as cumbersome of what I wore when I was younger. And, you know, I'm wearing shorts longer than I'm wearing tights, and, you know, um, I'm swimming in the ocean in the winter. I sort of got into this cold water swimming. Um, I read the book, Why We Swim, and I sort of said, yeah, I'm going to try this, and it, it really feels good, and uh, I think that's keeping me in the game. So you talked a little bit about sort of the, the weather in Maine, um, the year in 84, but um, you have a, this love of Maine. You live here, you train here, you are deeply connected to your hometown and Beach to Beacon and Friends of Casco Bay, and, and it's, it's a big driver for you. And so how does all of your love of Maine sort of fit in with your deep connections to the environment? 
Well, everybody thinks Maine is a pristine state. I mean, it's vacation land, right? And it is a beautiful state. I mean, I, I never take living in Maine for granted. I wake up every morning and say how fortunate and blessed I am to live in this great place. And um, I just, I just feel deeply rooted here. And um, you know, my connection to Bowdoin, living just down the road a piece, 8.2 miles exactly, um, in Freeport, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> makes me feel connected to this place. And I, you know, when I'm not running, I'm cycling, and I ride by the campus at least three or four times a week, or run by the campus. And it's just nice to keep a pulse on what's happening here. Uh, but, you know, when I um, came into the tunnel in LA in 84, into the darkness of the tunnel, I asked myself if I'd be prepared to come into the light on the other side and possibly win the marathon for the first time it had ever been contested. And um, or during the first time it had been contested. And I thought for a nanosecond, you'll figure it out. And the first thing I said to um, my fiance, now husband, and family and friends uh, was, don't let this moment in time change the person I am and make sure I give back to a community and a state that had given so much to me to get me to this point. Janet just talked in the lecture she, or the chat she had about, um, it's not I, it's we. It, it takes a village, it takes a team. Um, and I so believe that. And they did not let me forget that. And that led to the founding of the Beach to Beacon 10K in my hometown because I really wanted to welcome the world to some of the most beautiful roads I thought there were, given all the places I'd gone to to run and compete. And uh, I remember, I remember um, the moment the, the president of then People's Heritage Bank, Bill Ryan, uh, grabbed onto the idea. I tried to sell the idea earlier to Unum, which was Union Mutual, um, and their logo, corporate logo, was the Lighthouse Beacon, and I had come up with the name Beach to Beacon. And I was at a then Gulf of Maine Aquarium board meeting, and Jim Orr, the then president of, the, of, of Union Mutual, was uh, on the board, and he excused himself early, and I excused myself on his coattails, and said, may I just have your ear for, like, <laughs> two minutes, and he said, yes, what's going on? He said, oh, that's a good idea, but I don't think we're in a position to do that right now. And he had been uh, a varsity athlete and a member of the 4x400 relay at uh, Villanova, and uh, he was an All-American, and I thought, well, if anybody's going <laughs> to grab onto this idea, he will. And he didn't, and then two years later, um, Bill Ryan didn't even blink. And I didn't even know I was going to be asking them this question, but I was leaving his office after a brief meeting, and I saw him finishing the New York City Marathon. And I said, do you run marathons? <laughs> and he said, yes, why do you ask? And I said, well, I'd love to talk to you about an idea I have sometime. And he said, well, there's no time like the present. And I, he just didn't even miss a beat. And then the following summer, after the first race, I ran into um, Jim Ryan at a social engagement, and I was walking in this direction, and he was walking in that direction. He said, don't even go there. Don't <laughs> even go there. And uh, so um, Maine's a small state, as many of you will, if you don't know, quickly learn. Um, so uh, it's been a great journey. We've been re uh, virtual for two years, and we're planning to be live this August 6th. The next year will be our 25th anniversary. So you are a lifelong competitor. Um, you are a lifelong learner in all sorts of ways. And um, what does recovery look like for you? How do you take a breath? I'll rest when I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just don't stop. And you know, one of the questions you sent to me was, um, what are your failures? And I think my failures or my failure is that I don't take the time to live in the moment or bask in the finality or the 
the goal that's achieved because I'm always moving on to the next thing. And I think I could be more reflective and I think that would serve me well because I literally don't stop. And um, years ago, Nike did a, a campaign with me entitled There Is No Finish Line and they wanted to have some snow in the in the photo and the snow was receding very quickly here in southern Maine and so we had to travel north and we found a ribbon of snow on the roadside and that's where the photographer wanted to take the picture and I'm saying, there is no finish line, what does this mean? And you know, I was game to play and <laughs> we we uh, did the, the shoot and uh, they ran the campaign and I, I didn't know what it meant then, and I don't think Nike knew who they were choosing as an athlete <laughs> to marquee in the event, in the, in the campaign, but it's worked out, and uh, it's through storytelling that I motivate myself to set the next goal and then go out and try to achieve that goal. So um, what would you tell Joan Benoit, the Joan Benoit from 1979, if you could go back and tell her anything? I would tell her that she made the right decision to go to a D3 school as opposed to a D1 school where students can be athletes and athletes can be students. And Because I've been on both sides. I, I ran here at Bowdoin. I ran uh, for a year and a half at NC State on one of the first Title IX scholarships. And then I coached at Boston University. So um, I've seen both sides. and. Um, to be honest with you, I had more fun with the walk-on athletes than with the scholarship athletes because they were out there because of the passion they had for sport and not as a way to finance an education. And that was really, really evident to me. And uh, I'm still in touch with the team on a regular basis. They're all doing great. And, um, but that's the lesson I learned from sports and and universities and, and colleges. And I think balance is critical in everybody's life, but especially in a student athlete's life. And I was able to achieve that balance here at Bowdoin. So um, I'll, I'm gonna ask my last question and then we'll open it up, but um, what advice do you have for the class of 2022 that's graduating from Bowdoin College? If you have the opportunity, anything is possible. And um, I think being, graduating from this esteemed institution, you've had numerous opportunities here and you'll have more opportunities as you go forward and just realize that opportunities can lead to great achievements and fulfillment. All right, thank you. So. So we have a little bit of time um, for questions. I do not have mics, so if you could just um, uh, announce your question, I will then repeat it so everybody else can hear it, and then um, Joni will answer. I also know it's the most courageous thing to be the first person to ask a question, so. Yes. So the question is, um, can you talk about your race strategy from 1984? Well, believe it or not, I never have a strategy going into a race. <laughs> <laughs> I never look at marathon courses before I run because what I don't know won't hurt me. And if I looked at 26.2 <laughs> miles, I would think myself crazy in the head. Um, so I just literally run the way I feel every day. But I've always told myself, you can't run any else's race except your own. So in LA, um, as I said earlier, I thought uh, Greta Weitz would win the first Olympic marathon for women. She had at the time, I think eight or nine New York City marathon wins, an unprecedented number of wins. Um, I was also very concerned about her teammate, Ingrid Christensen, who wound up fourth. And right before on the Olympics, on one of my last training runs, I saw a woman running with an entourage of, of cyclists and other runners, and 
thought, hmm, I don't know who she is, but if she's running the marathon, she's going to win a medal. And I remember getting home, back to where I was staying uh, with a family in their guest house because I left the Olympic Village after the first night because we were adjacent to the um, swimming pool and the Americans were doing really well and I was, my adrenaline was flowing and I was going to lose all my adrenaline if I stayed there. So somebody opened up their guest house to me very nicely and, and so I stayed out there, which was really the best thing I could have done. But I saw this woman and I got back to the house where I was staying and I said to my coach, I don't know who I saw out there, but if she's running the Olympic marathon, she's going to win a medal. So now there are, you know, all these runners I think are who I think are capable of running, winning medals. And um, I just kept telling myself, you know, you've trained hard, you overcame the knee injury before and the surgery before the Olympic trials. You're not going to cave. And uh, so we, the Olympic marathon day came along and we started at Santa Monica City College and there was a parade of athletes and the U.S. being the host nation marched last and because I was the shortest member of our delegation, I was in the caboose position. So my mantra around the track was last shall come first and first shall come last, last shall come. And so I kept saying that to myself <laughs> and then the gun went off and um, we headed out and no, but we were all bunched up and nobody seemingly wanted to take the lead, so I said, well, I'm not running very efficiently, I'm running their pace, I'm not running my race, get out of the pack and just run. And that's what I did, and I bypassed the first water station, and the commentators thought I'd made a grave error, fortunately I couldn't hear them. <laughs> um, <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, just went about my business, and approached the LA freeway, which is where I felt the most at home because they didn't allow any vehicular traffic on the freeway. So I was really all by myself on a foggy, humid morning thinking I was, you know, up on Pleasant Hill somewhere, just up off campus. <laughs> and uh, so I put my mind in that space and didn't feel the stress of being in such a big event on the global stage. And it worked, but uh, you know, I was in the right place at the right time, and if the event had been held the day earlier, a day later, a week, or whatever, it could have been totally different. But that's, I had the opportunity. And the other thing, Greta Weitz had let down her guard a little bit in the Olympic Village and was complaining about back spasms. So the lesson there is, if you feel a weakness, don't let anybody know about it if you're competing <laughs> against them because that shows, shows that you're vulnerable and, you know, the hunter goes in for the, for the hunting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jen. So I'm just going to say, repeat it. Two questions. The runner's high, sort of, and what do you think about in all those hours out on the road? Well, the second question I'll answer first because that's easier. I think of everything I, else I should be doing while I'm out <laughs> running. <laughs> and my best training at runs are when I paint myself into a corner because I know I have to be someplace <laughs> and I haven't allowed enough time. So then I run really fast, so I'll be somewhat on time. I'm not the most punctual person, but I try to be. Um, and that goes back to my weakness. Um, but as far as the runner's high, um, that refers to the endorphins in a runner's mind. And so runners tend to have high levels of endorphins. And so you sort of feel like you're high, I guess. I mean, I've never been high on anything else except <laughs> endorphins. So um, it's a good feeling. I mean, it's a great feeling. And I do refer to my career in two um, phases, BC and AD, before children and after diapers. And before, <laughs> before I had children, I always planned my day around my running. And after having children, I planned my running around my day. 
And I cut way back on my training. Instead of running twice a day, I only ran once a day. And my endorphins really plummeted. And I had some real anxiety for a while. Um, and uh, so I, I was struggling a bit. And then I decided I have a roommate who's uh, going to be with us tonight. And I didn't want to medicate, but she gave me a lot of different uh, books and articles to read. So. I incorporated one long run into my weekly workout, which had, you know, fallen off considerably, and everything leveled out again, and I've been fine ever since. But it's it's a real feeling, and when you're having a great race, I mean, you can feel the endorphins elevate, like as you're coming down the final stretch. And I I, I remember having that feeling once at a race at UVA, and I was coming, and I was like, whoa, I'm flying. You know, <laughs> that was really cool. <laughs> but usually I'm just trying to get to the finish line, and I'm <laughs> exhausted. Yes. Either one of you. What's your motivator? Procrastination. <laughs> um, if I have um, a race in mind, you know, in goal setting, there are short-term goals and long-term goals. And I t often talk about the importance of not compromising those goals, but instead set intermediate goals. And um, I was trying to remember Janet's line about roadblocks, not being roadblocks, but stepping stones. That was awesome. So, um, uh, yeah, you just say, okay, you got to pull back a little bit, maybe set some more intermediate goals. Maybe you're not going to be ready for that race, but don't lose sight of where you want to be down the road, no pun intended, you know. And... You know, there are periods that I've run through where I just wondered if I'd ever come out of the hole. And, and I do other things. I mean, cross-training's helpful, um, just getting involved in a project or setting another priority. And eventually it, it comes back. It sometimes takes longer than any of us would like. But, um, you know, I've had lots of injuries, lots of surgeries. I had a, a knee replacement a year ago a little over a year ago, and they said it would take a year, and I said, it's not going to take me a year. It took me a year, but now I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good. And I, the other thing is I waited until I found a surgeon who told me I would run again because everybody said, oh, no, you're not going to run again. And so, you know, you need to find in any sort of therapy or any sort of business relationship or any, you know, professor-student relationship, the chemistries have to, to mix in order for both parties to feel successful and that they're accomplishing something. My pleasure. Thank you for being here. I think uh, balance mind, body, spirit, trying to establish that balance and keep that balance. Um, I think uh, a lot of college athletes, student athletes, I don't like to call them athletes, student athletes, um, turn to running after they graduate because it's not as easy for them to play a team sport if they've been playing a team sport. And as I said earlier, it's accessible and affordable. Um, there are lots of running clubs everywhere you look, especially in the major cities, and it's a good way to establish friendships um, as, as graduates, and, um, you know, runners have lives outside of running. Many runners have real jobs and families and, and uh, you know, community um, obligations. And I just think the balance that I've worked so hard to establish and continue to maintain as best I can um, have, have helped me out considerably, and an understanding husband who was a pole vaulter, um, <laughs> uh, to, and, and kids. I mean, we've tried to introduce our children to all sorts of disciplines and all sorts of, you know, 
lifelong pursuits. And we never pushed running on them. It would bother me if I went to a sporting event and people would have expectations for our kids and, and I tried to pretend I didn't hear any of this, but it was, it was hard on them. And um, they found their own paths and they can do things in sports like surfing and snowboarding that Scott and I can't do. And <laughs> you know, it all, it all works out. Um, but I think the worst thing a parent can do is push a child into a sport, and I tell parents not to have their children specialize until they're the age of 14, because I think you pick up different strengths and different athletic pursuits, and they can all come together and culminate in making an athlete successful in whatever discipline it is she or he wants to pursue. Um, and that, that sort of was the path I, I followed. Um, but I think as I age, I, I, I'm understanding the importance of cross-training and doing other things. Yes. What are your plans for the next five years? Well, I just entered a new age group and I should be retiring at my new age. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm hope. I, I try to come up with a reason or a story in order to pursue something. So I just turned that new age, which is the retirement age, and our daughter's turning 35, so we're thinking of running the London Marathon because that's one of the world six-star marathons, and I only have four of them now. I need to run London and Tokyo, and I've run the others numerous times, so I probably have 36 stars, but... <laughs> Um, they have to be in designated marathons. So um, that's keeping me going. But now we have a one-year-old granddaughter. So I'm thinking, is it more important to try to run a marathon with our daughter or try to run a 5K in five years with a daughter and a granddaughter? So, um, you know, I just, I just sort of go with the flow and go with whatever my mindfulness is telling me to do. But... Uh, um, it's just every day. I, I said to a, um, a, a fellow trustee who showed up for the run this morning that um, every day I can run is a gift because I was wondering, you know, two years ago if I'd ever be able, able to run um, after I had the knee issues. And um, so, you know, just like I don't take Maine for granted, I don't take my ability to run for granted either. It's what I'm passionate about. And if you don't have passion, you don't have fire. And if you don't have fire, you can't ignite anything in the world. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, who are your heroes? I have a lot of heroes. My mother, like Janet mentioned her mother. Um, mother's, I'm not quite as old as Janet, although she looks a lot younger than <laughs> I am. <laughs> Um, you know, there were so few role models for me in sport when I was growing up. Um, and I did play tennis, so obviously Billie Jean King was one of those. Most of my heroes were in, in, in um, ski racing. Um, Sally Ride, I mean, for a woman to go into space, that was pretty special. But my mother, I have three brothers, and I was the the real athlete in the family. And sh we always <laughs> ate at six. I mean, we ate at six, but I was trying to get a second run in, so it became 6.15, 6.30. Um, so she, but she was also the one who embraced me at the Olympics when I did my victory lap and, and, and leaned over and said, now can you quit? <laughs> and I said, I said, Mom, I still have goals I'd like to achieve, um, so no. But if you <laughs> quit smoking, I'll think about it. And she quit smoking within the year and lived to be 15 days shy of her 99th birthday, um, but always worried about my knees. She said, I worry about your knees, I worry about your knees, and my knee didn't go south until after she passed. But um, So she, she got it. 
and because we were the only girls in the family, um, that was really special. We have time for one more question. Sure, in the back, yes. My warm-up routine. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> um, you know, I always say I'm going to be out the door at a given time, and then something gets in the way, um, and then, you know, I'm behind schedule, and then I realize, you know, it's 8.30, and I have to be someplace at 10 o'clock. But this is, you know, this, you know, to all the students and all the graduates, God bless you for persevering through this pandemic with the remote, in-class, remote, virtual, whatever, um, really. And to your professors, I just, I sing accolades for you. I just, um, it's been tough. But for me, not going to meetings and being able to do everything on Zoom has been, has opened doors for me. Um, but I never run with a phone, so I never do a Zoom on the run. Um, <laughs> and so I'm still painting myself into those corners trying to get back in time. And it's always for me, can I sneak in one more mile? Can I sneak? And that becomes the speed work. But um, my, my, I, I'm running more negative splits these t days, meaning my miles are getting faster at the end because it really takes me a while for my knee to get warmed up in order to find my stride. But now my Achilles, which has literally been my Achilles heel on the opposite <laughs> foot, is bothering me. So that means I'm getting back into my old stride, which is a good sign. But now my Achilles is bothering me more than my knee, so I don't know what that means. <laughs> it's a balancing act, right? It's truly a balancing act. and, and um, you know, I've been blessed with the longevity that somebody asked about, but I think that's just because of the balance that I work so hard to, to achieve. I appreciate you all coming, and uh, this has been fun, and uh, thank you. Thank you for being here.